Thank you, Joel. I can't help but feeling a little bit like we're TV broadcast hosts right now. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Liv Cazola, and I am coming to you from Guelph, Ontario. Uh, I'm usually performing in bands Tragedy Anne and the Lifers. I am a music teacher and an enthusiastic advocate for the earth, and that's kind of what's bringing me here today. Uh, I'm here representing both Music Declares and Folk Music Ontario's environmental advocacy team. So as everyone is all too aware, this music community has had to take a really hard look at how we're doing things right now. And I feel like this is really just an opportunity for us to reimagine our relationship with each other as a community and our relationship with the earth. So today we're gonna to be looking at that kind of change that will allow everything on earth to thrive in harmony. As Joel mentioned, it's the final workshop in the series, focusing our intentions on moving forward into a lower carbon future together. So in today's circle, we're hearing from four leaders who are really prioritizing environmental stewardship in their work to support artists and the industry as a whole. I hope that everyone is gonna come away feeling both inspired and informed about what kind of real things that they can do, practical, effective, achievable strides towards environmental sustainability. So joining me today, that'll help me in making this possible is Stevie Smith, the CEO of the Americana Music Association in the UK, Linnea Svensson, a board member at Greener Events in Norway, Adam Kreeft, an agent at Good Company and a Music Declares teammate of mine, Ian Garrett, who is an associate professor of ecological design for performance in the Department of Theatre at York University, and Kyle Kunjak, who is an artist, artist manager, and co-founder of Forward Music Group. So you're all welcome to voice questions that you might have throughout this, uh, this event today. Uh, you're welcome to just voice it in the chat and uh, we will get to that at a specific time. In fact, I'm going to just go over the agenda briefly so you know what's going to go on. Uh, so after we get to know the speakers, and some examples of their green work that they've been doing. There's gonna be a moderated conversation followed by that Q&A that I mentioned. So you can, you can just note any questions that you have before then. Uh, after that, we're gonna try something new here and we're gonna do a little bit of research sharing uh, circle. So if anything comes to mind, things that have been helpful for you and your um, environmental stewardship work so far, you can share it. Uh, it's kind of a free for all uh, conversation, shouting out what's helpful, maybe writing it in the chat so people have a link. And then at the end, we'll just let you know about some concrete calls to action and announcements. Okay, so without further ado, I would love for each speaker to just give a quick 30 second intro and um, an intention of why they chose to participate in this workshop. So uh, the way I see it on my screen, the person immediately to my right is Kyle. So I'll ask you to go first, please. Of course, hello. Um, okay, so a bit of background for those of you who don't know, we're based in Halifax. I run a company called Forward Music Group. Uh, we're a management team and record label that works with primarily Canadian artists to release, promote, distribute their works, provide resources, and uh, support them in any way we can to develop sustainable careers for them through composition, exhibition, and performance, musical and otherwise. Um, we represent artists outside of the commercial spectrum and who strive for creative exper experimentation and expression. So uh, as a management team, we try to further their careers um, through presenting challenging contemporary non-commercial compositions and doing these uh, exhibitions in you know ways that maybe aren't standard as well. So I feel like a lot of this um, has worked in tandem with doing things differently and in it, because of that you know we've able we've been able to do things in an environmentally friendly way or at least think about it through that lens um, we try to offer artist-friendly contracts and maintain a peer relationship with our roster 
and in the before times when we had an office uh, before COVID, we would try to maintain that as a community hub where people could drop by and kind of ask us questions whenever they wanted. And we could kind of uh, host people and kind of foster our community there to develop um, for, you know, opportunities that we might have not had when we were starting out. So um, the reason why I was interested in participating in this conversation is I want to keep having these sorts of conversations um, learning and telling people how we've done things, what, you know, that give them some ideas that they might not have thought about and um, take away a lot of ideas that we might not have thought about before this. So really happy to be here. I love that. Yeah, that's what community is all about to me. All right. And next in the circle is Stevie. Hi, um, my name is Stevie Smith and I'm the CEO of the Americana Music Association in the UK. We have about a thousand members in our association who all work within the Americana music genre and we hold the UK Americana Music Week in London every January, which is an international showcase festival and conference. And uh, one of the reasons that uh, I think I'm here today is um, we are very conscious of the fact that we can advise and help and work with all of these artist members as well as industry. A lot of our members are festival organizers and agents on thinking about how to be more eco and how to make their events as green as possible. And we wanted to be a festival that demonstrated and worked on making our festival as, as um, green as we could and get that message across at our conference and working with all sorts of different people which I'm sure we'll talk about um, soon but it was it was mostly um, we educate in so many areas and we just felt that we had to make this part of our agenda on a permanent basis and it's a global international showcase festival so we're expecting a lot of people to fly into the UK and this year we were forced by Covid to take our event online and it opened our eyes to how much we could still do without expecting that many people to get in an airplane and so we are developing how we do our showcasing um, with doing a hybrid event in 2022 so never stop learning basically and uh, like Kyle I'm looking forward to picking up some great tips today. That's great thank you. Ian? Thanks. Um, hi, Ian Garrett. Um, I wear a few different hats. Uh, as you mentioned, I teach at York University here in Toronto um, on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat, where the current treaty holders are the Mississaugas of the credit. Um, I teach ecological design for performance, where my background is primarily um, as a lighting and media designer for all sorts of performing arts and installation. Uh, so uh, I'm educating students on how to do that from an echocenographic lens. I also run an organization independent of the university called the Center for Sustainable Practice in the Arts, which has uh, been working on this topic um, for uh, uh, some time and uh, have a, a small collective that I'm a part of called Toaster Lab, which also does performing arts uh, um, design and, uh, and media work. And uh, I think uh, some of the, the highlights uh, that, that bring some relevancy as to why I'm excited to be here. Um, I am a board member of the Associated Designers of Canada, which uh, many of the, uh, pro, uh, those who are doing design for the performing arts are members of, and have recently been uh, working on green writers with a number of our partners to start adding to our contracts. Uh, we're going through a process, um, we being the CSBA and a number of partners are working on adapting uh, tools from the UK, from Julie's Bicycle, um, their creative green tools, which are um, a really approachable carbon assessment uh, uh, program and adapting that for the Canadian context for hopefully to be put into use next year, um, uh, especially once we can get together. And I think especially relevant uh, in this room, and perhaps uh, to you specifically, Liv, is um, the work that we did with the Hillside Festival there in Guelph for about three years, which led to it becoming a carbon neutral festival in its last in-person incarnation before going entirely online with, uh, with things. And I'm really excited because I, I feel like the arts uh, 
uh, if it wasn't obvious, uh, uh, that uh, there's a lot of uh, um, ground to be gained through our connections with creating community and connecting with audiences that uh, through all of those projects we've seen have been one of the biggest factors in working towards uh, environmental, uh, environmentally positive action, has been able to connect with those communities that get brought together through uh, arts events. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here to talk about those. Yeah, I feel it's really full circle because in the first uh, workshop series that we did at the beginning of May, Marie from Hillside was here talking about some of the work that you did together. So I had a lot of questions in my brain about that. So it's nice that you're here to kind of cap it off from this perspective. All right, Adam. Good afternoon, everybody. Or evening or morning, I suppose. Uh, my name is Adam Kreeft. I'm here in Toronto. Um, I wear a few hats primarily. I've spent the last 10 years as an agent through agency group and spent a couple, well, did a couple laps with uh, Pekan and Feldman. Uh, got out in front of COVID and launched Good Company with a probably a handful of uh, clients on the touring side and then a handful of clients on a management side while also dabbling in um, just getting a merch platform going that was focused on sustainability. Uh, I've been working alongside Liv, getting Music Declares going over here, uh, as well as just a video content platform in, in trying to shoot live performance videos from the perspective of the, of the director uh, featuring artists. Um, a few of the things I'm dabbling in, but uh, I am here today share a little bit about my experience, but I also feel like I could very easily be on the other side of this and just tuning in to learn. So i um, happy to contribute where I can, um, but it's it's a learning process and, and I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Thanks for acknowledging that, Adam. I feel very similar here. All right, and Linnea. Hello. Uh, good evening, I have to say, from, uh, from my end uh, in Oslo, Norway. This is so such a nice opportunity and uh, great to see you all. Uh, my background is basically from the festival side of the music industry. And then I moved on into TV production film, uh, but also consulting sporting events and uh, also working with urban development events and this, that kind of sector because it's uh, all year or every day uh, festival in many ways working with place making and other kinds of tools uh, I am also um, you know uh, connected to a foundation in Norway called the uh, Greener Events Foundation which was founded by the snowboarder Tarja Håkonsen but that uh, some might know of uh, but uh, I also teach at the Norwegian Business School in Sustainable Event Management and uh, working with the Oya Festival, which several times has been declared one of the greatest festivals, uh, has been very uh, a, a great travel, which I, of course, have in my luggage when I, I um, consult or help other uh, events doing what they can do in sustainability. And recently, I, I project managed a green roadmap for the Norwegian arts and cultural sector. Uh, so I will share some uh, thoughts from that. I also am very active in the European festival sector with the, the of course, I know Julius Bicycle, but also working from uh, the Go, Go Group, the Green Operations Europe group with the Europe, the festival organization. Um, yeah, and like you all, uh, I'm here, of course, to share some points, but I'm very curious what you all uh, are up to, especially now from staying in this kitchen for one and a half years. We are slowly opening up in Oslo tomorrow, so I'm definitely here to, to learn and hear what you all are up to. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I feel like what you were talking about there kind of leads into what I was hoping for each of us to touch on briefly. So we'll go maybe in the reverse order for this. Um, I'd love for each of us to just start out with just saying one specific example of what you think your most impactful sustainable act has been as an organization. So, Linnea, so I'm the first up. You're, you're oh. first this time. <laughs> 
actually i'm you know do you know like the terms like if you squirrel you kind of change your focus a bit so right at this moment i'm um my students i have 80 students uh, i'm uh, correcting their exam papers <laughs> and i feel like maybe that's the most important thing i can do is to to i'm you know in my mid 40s so uh, sharing and encouraging and helping new young voices and giving them um, a good start into this industry and make them make sure that they also at the same time have workplaces uh, where um, they can uh, you know blossom and and have the courage to do that i think maybe at the moment i feel that's the most important thing that they get the tools and that uh, that they have um, you know the ambition to make events sustainable i think that's maybe the most important thing yeah i feel like being empowered is like a huge step in making sure that something can happen yeah. it's been kind of like a secret little club that we've done for a long time i've been doing this for 20 years uh, and i see some nods and smiles um yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> Wow. Does anybody else want to touch? I guess we can continue going in reverse order. Adam, if you want to touch on what you think is one of the most important sustainable things you've done. I feel like it's a trick question, having only gotten this company started two months before COVID happened. Um, and the paradox that is touring and trying to do it sustainably. Um, but it's probably just awareness and, and education and trying to show a generation coming up underneath um whether artists agents managers whomever that there there is a better and more innovative way to go about this that it doesn't have to feel so get it well it's hot flash in the pan that you can create a long um, and sustainable business in a sustainable way i love that yeah something i've uh, admired about you recently too, Adam, is um, all of the work that you put together for, I hope you can touch on this later, but um, the merch tent umbrella, um, making sure that merch can be as sustainable as we can if we still want to offer things to people. All right, Ian. Yeah, um, I mean, not not too dissimilar from both Adam and Linnea, is that like, I, well, I'll offer I'll offer an anecdote that sort of is very much along the lines of what Lydia was saying is that talking to um, another organizational leader recently and we were both like concerned that we were because we had been at it for a while like both of our organizations were founded 2007 2008 and had been doing you know the the work for a while um, and it, it was like are we are we we the people kept coming out of the woodwork and it's like are we like not aware of what's going on. And then I, sort of like after a little bit of thought with it, just sort of realize there is so much going on now. Like it's expanded so much recently um, that like that tenacity has paid off. Uh, so uh, that it was like, we just couldn't keep it all in our heads anymore. There was a, like a time when you could like be like, here are the people who are doing this within this community. And now, it's impossible to do that without like some sort of electronic assistance. So I often say that like the most sustainable thing about the, the CSBA, the Center for Sustainable Practice in the Arts is that we just like sustained, we didn't go away. Um, and so like that sort of tenacity and connecting things together, providing educational resources, like just get supporting people who are interested in exploring this topic and changing their practices, the type of work that they make and doing that consistently has been the, the most sustainable thing that we've done, regardless of any other individual project. I feel like that's the definition of sustainability, <laughs> is being able to do it long term and in a positive way. So that's, that's a great answer. I love it. How about you, Stevie? So in, I think it was 2016, maybe 2015, I went to the Great Escape uh, Conference and Julie's Bicycle was doing a panel. So I went along and um, there were four people there. And I'd been at conferences all day that were packed rooms. And I just looked around, just thought, what, what on earth, why does no one care? And we sat in a room, the four of us, we just got in a circle and shared ideas. And the big thing was like, how can we make more people want to realize how important this is for them? Um, green riders, what can we do? What are the small things we can do that won't scare people? 
because people are afraid to come to this meeting because they think we're going to tell them not to tour anymore and not to do these things. So I realized, you know, my position with all the members and the conference panels that I organized that we could start to make small steps and we could start to take away the scare factor of trying to be more sustainable within the music business. And so the first thing we did at our festival was say we are um, and at the very first point of connection with artists who are going to come to our event is we have no plastic bottles on our festival. So bring your own reusable bottle. And it was a small step, but it was incredible how much resistance we had, mostly from the bigger artists who seemed to think that tap water was out of their, uh, was no longer part of their life. Um, but we, but it, but it, it worked. And, and it was something that we, we said, you know, you, we started to do some diagrams of people like how many, we've got 800 members who tour and the rest of the members who organize festivals. If we all think about how many plastic bottles just our tiny genre produces per year. And once we started to do diagrams and put them up there on the screens at conferences, people start to gasp and think, oh my God, this is ridiculous. It's such a small individual thing we can do to make such a big difference. And by doing that, I think, we started the conversation in a way that made it easy to achieve, uh, something they could all do. They could, we started to talk about green riders, something all of them could start to do to make that small change that made them realize that sustainability isn't out of their reach. So I think that is the thing, small green steps, small green shoots. Yeah, making it feel accessible for people who might not have entered into that before. That's such important work and hard to do. It's a delicate balance. So it's, it's really nice to hear success stories like that. All right. And Kyle. Um, I love that everybody has basically just said that, um, you know, the fact that a lot of the most impactful acts can just be planting seeds into people's minds about how to do things differently. And once you start thinking about that, that just helps spiral into more and more. And then the more you talk to other people, I just really think that that's one of the best things and that's how we all learn and grow. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, the most impo impactful thing that I think we've done recently over the past year is we shifted our entire advertising budget um, and committed to not spending anything on destructive platforms like Facebook and instead committed to um, putting all our ads into smaller growing publications and trying to spread that around, not just in Canada, but there is a focus obviously with uh, regional and then in our country, but also international. And just seeing what, you know, what magazines, music magazines or otherwise that we respected and wanted to advertise with. And it's funny that we were just stuck in a rut before thinking that way about where our advertising dollars went and just thought, you know, I couldn't, sitting on juries before you see a lot of people with their entire ad and marketing plan as a Facebook thing. But um, I've seen a lot of success and I think there's a lot of examples of once you start doing something differently, it actually is beneficial to your business. So we've seen a lot of, um, uh, just by advertising with a lot of these smaller publications, they're just so much more appreciative of it and supportive to us and our artists later on, even if we just do an ad once a year, um, it just really helps spread things around. So I think that that's been a big part of it. We also committed to doing monthly donations to social justice and environmental organizations um, in a model similar to like the 1% for the planet. And I think that that's been really good to just learn every month about a different organization, again, trying to spread things around and help uh what we can you know putting our money where our mouth is even if that's just a small amount so i think anything can help like that totally and i love how many values are kind of put together in that uh that work that you're saying about um steering away from the large advertising opportunities and and just yeah what comes from that is is so great so thanks for touching on that as well Okay, so uh, I would love to learn, Linnea, I, you told me a little bit about the green roadmap that you were working with. And when you sent me the PDF, I was so happy to see it. And yet it was not in the language that I know. So I would love for you to give us a little bit of a summary of what that's like. <laughs> yeah, I actually shared that with the steering groups, uh, the, the committee today, and they actually gave me um, uh, they were okay with us actually translating it. So thank you for asking for that. Um, uh, it's uh, divided in two levels. So it's 
five points that organizations and projects can do in a strategic level. Uh, which uh, basically is about uh, sustainability management and giving somebody the mandate and the role of doing this work. Um, and then there are some more steps uh, connected to that. And then uh, we decided to make five steps or uh, immediate uh, action points. And that's to look into purchasing, <laughs> uh, waste management, transport, energy use and also um, CO2 calculation to actually understand and know your um, your footprint. But it's also about um, some steps that uh, artists can do. And of course, also the governmental organization, both local, regional and national. And I mean, uh, in Oslo, Norway, we looked to Ontario for a long time because we really liked to model how to work with the music sector. When I work with the programming of the Bülern conference, it's a Nordic music conference, uh, we invited people over to understand the way you work. And I guess it's all about really understanding the infrastructure to really understand where to enhance and help and to gather tools and resources. And we kind of looked into those kinds of systems for, I mean, it's all about change management basically. And we came up with five points for the governments to, to start working into a resource center, into a program for green innovation. And also uh, for uh, the green shift that a lot of the um, organizations need to do. And these are, everything from the national opera and national theater down to the cinemas and the small music clubs it's everything uh, in this sector and we of course work for the sustainability goals uh, uh, as a tool for this uh, but the point is the intention behind it all is to have something common uh, and also to explain it in a visually understandable way and that's maybe something i myself missed out on when developing similar uh, tools. I mean, we made environmentalhandbook.com uh, ages ago. Um, I think it was back in 2004 for the OYA Festival and it's still online. I will type in the link for you, it's in English. But it's about the visualization and Ian knows this and maybe he can elaborate more on how the visual you know, experience actually enhances the whole understanding uh, of the content that is communicated, um, except for you know working on and having a common voice. I think we had over thirty interest organizations from the whole sector. You know everything from artists to musicians to uh, live music association, the theater and orchestra, and so on. Um, just to, for all of them to have a common voice, that's very, it's not normal. Maybe now because it's a big crisis that they have to talk uh, and collaborate in a different way. Uh, that was also intentional, but to make a Norwegian tool in calculating the carbon offset uh, or to be able to offset even or understanding the footprint, that was also important. And uh, a project uh, connected to the um, uh, to to this roadmap uh, was given some uh, national funds to develop one, and it will take it's the, it, it's our IPCC uh, institute that will come uh, called Cicero that is working on it. So um, it will take some time. Uh, they could probably just translate the industry green tool from Julius Bicycle, but still it's about uh, our country having a, a bit of a different footprint. And it's also the last thing to understand your stakeholders and also the whole life cycle. And you all will elaborate more on that, I'm sure. But those are some key factors in that roadmap to understand your place and your role in this whole thing and what to hack and change yeah oh my gosh yes it's it's it can be overwhelming when you think about all of the stakeholders and all of the people who hold the power uh but i feel like the things that are over 
often overwhelming are also a huge opportunity for how we can try to find a way to have everyone work together for it. I feel like I'd like to speak to Stevie next about this because you you were saying how you some of the work you do is trying to engage those bigger names and agents to be climate leaders. So um, there's a lot of synergy, it seems, between the two, the work that both of you do. But what, what's your experience been like with that, Stevie? Well, I mean, really, it hasn't been it hasn't been positive. It, um, I, I want to try. We all know that the people who make an impact when it comes to the public and, and, and um, you know, making big businesses take notice are the people who are going to make them money or the people that interest them or influence them. So getting the bigger names um, to understand. But I, I just came across personally at one of our award shows a couple of years ago when I first said we are having no plastic bottles. And then for the showcase festival, all the artists who were coming to London understood and they were like yeah no no of course we're going to bring our own bottle you know or we'll drink tap water out of a paper cup we're not but when it came to the award show the actually um the person who's producing the show is just like you can't possibly do that you you know and I, I I couldn't quite believe I was having a conversation with someone a management company who was standing in the way of suggesting that someone like Robert Plant didn't know how to drink out of a glass and had to have a sealed plastic water bottle. And I was just like, Robert Plant toured in the seventies and the things he's done, he can drink water out of a glass, you know, but I had to, it, it was like this wall that I couldn't get to him. And if I knew that if I could get to that point where, where we can get those artists, you know, and Billy Bragg, for example, is a great artist who instantly understood what I was talking about and changed his whole touring plan. And Frank Turner, I don't know if you know Frank Turner, was the same. He instantly kind of took on board. He was at the at the conference the year that we were really pushing this. And he was just like changed his whole touring plan. He talked about it on stage at every gig to all his audience members. He made his whole team like just ch change those things. And those people are the ones that we need to get when, when it comes to influence, you know, making big business understand that we are in charge of that kind of spending and we're in charge of that kind of messaging. And so I want to find more ways to make the people, the people that are higher up in the, in the chain to, you know, not just the likes of us and the people here in the room who we, who know those small changes make a difference. So yeah, any, any, any messaging I can do, like I'm constantly on it. And like we had Music Declares Emergency, we did a whole day of our conference last year with them and Julie's Bicycle and all of that stuff for eco packaging for cds and everything at the conference and we're just going to keep on doing it every single year it's going to be a focus and every award show we're just pushing now and the, um any management company that stands in my way is going to have trouble from now on because i'm i'm literally not taking no for an answer anymore it's taken me about four years to get to the point where i'm just like no i'm not taking it so <laughs> anyone got any tips <laughs> It's hard to have that conviction sometimes, especially when you really want to foster a relationship with someone. Um, but it it's great that you make your your needs really clear as an organization. Yeah, Adam. Just to second what Stevie's saying, isn't it like hilarious that it seems to come across with this like stigma? Like there's these gatekeepers that like, how dare you ask my client for this or cool send the green rider but like good luck getting the venue to execute it and it just has this air about it that i have yet to figure out how to approach it without a pretentiousness isn't the right word but it comes across like that it, there, i there's a lovely artist who came by this morning she walks my dog from time to time and she's in a fairly prominent toronto band and we got to talking about this and merch and how she was trying to figure out how to like create sustainable merch and we got to talking about Green Rider, et cetera. And it just had this feeling of, well, my managers will go for that. They're old school, they're in LA, they're et cetera. Um, and it's, it's crazy that we have to figure out how to disarm them. But in the same breath, it's the artists that have to empower and enforce it and have to say it's going to be this way. I get it if you're Eddie Vedder and you can go and do all those things and that's amazing and you use that platform for that. But when you're a artist selling a 250 to 500 cap, you're just happy to be there. 
and to then stick your red smarties and everything else down everyone's throat becomes a little bit like, well, cool. I like your band, but I don't really want to have you back because that was a pain in the ass. And yeah, I just, I, I, is it more awareness? Is it more of a conversation? Is it more artists banding together and saying, this is, this is okay to be this way, not be this way as in, yeah. It, you know what I mean. <laughs> it's that, it's that thing. And I think we, within um, the association I've, that, that I'm organizing in, in the UK, that's what I'm saying. We, the, we are, we, there are many of us, let's get together and all have the same message within, and we, we're in within one genre, within the Americana genre, we can do this and start the snowball, you know, and I think that's kind of where the power lies. But it, but it's venues, you know. It's it. There's such a knock-on effect because you can stand on the stage and you can have this message. You know, we we tour. We've got green riders. We don't tour with plastic. My merchandise is eco. Blah blah blah. But then you, you look out in the audience and there's 800 people with a plastic beer cup in their hand because the venues got rid of their fridge because they don't want a washing up. You know, got rid of their washing up machine. You know, so there's there's this kind of. You have to start small, and we've got to just keep on pushing. And, and I think it is, it's getting together, it's, it's a numbers thing. Yeah, and the smaller artists need that power in numbers. And it's mm -hmm. supporting each other coming, especially the venues coming out of COVID. And it's like, I get it. You are gonna have to go and sanitize your bar and do all these things to even be open to try to make some of that revenue back how do we and is it branding and sponsorship opportunities to come in and offset the costs to do those things to facilitate not the return to normalcy that I think we're all a little anxiety ridden about but a new way of doing it and going hey pre-covid red cups everywhere post-covid here's the tap fill it up mm. yeah. we... or even the you know the cans because then you avoid the whole plastic thing or drinking thing but I, I think it's I had a, a webinar last week with an artist and she she was she never saw her writer she was never a part of making it it was just like a standard that her agency sent out and she didn't know that she could decide you know it's about she's traveling mostly in Norway and but she has uh, quite a big audience uh, and I thought it was lovely just for her to say, oh, I was not sh I was not aware that I'm actually in charge of this list myself. You know, it's about educating and sharing and just making people, um, you know, um, to stand up for those LA uh, managers or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and when you actually talk to people about it, uh, it's all right, but there are some gatekeepers here, and I think maybe that's the, the bottleneck that we need to to I don't know take away after COVID. I don't know, Adam. What do you think? <laughs> I actually I think the exciting thing or the thing that gives me a bit of hope is that the generation underneath us that is coming up that we all touched on earlier on educating and bringing awareness. Um, they are the ones that are already thinking that way and are already sort of enforcing it. I think the idea that you work for the artist is getting a little bit more ingrained instead of the artist works for the agent or the manager who, or whomever. But I, there is some hope, I think, coming up uh, with the Gen Zs and, and whatnot where mm -hmm. the, there's, there's a lot more aligned values, I think, from a consumer standpoint as well as a presentation standpoint. The, um, the talk of the writer is interesting, too, because a lot of artists don't realize that they're paying for that. And a lot of artists waste their writer a lot of the time. Um, so, I mean, just educating the artists on the fact that how the deal breaks down, if they realize, you know, that if they got a buyout and just or just asked for, you know, produce from a farmer's market or like very small rider that has no plastic waste, um, they're not spending. They're not. It's not costing them as much money they might have a little less to take in the van at the end of the night or you know they might have to like go eat a bit more after but i think i think there's ways of just avoiding the rider <laughs> mostly you know it seems like that's just a wasteful thing anyway that could be reshaped how many how many bottles of mustard had have ended up on the side of the road with like three squirts out of them half a pita and away you go yeah. and sometimes <laughs> I mean, it's also I Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Stevie. 
And I was going to say that was, I think for me, that was the moment with the water bottle thing, because it was like, I'd go backstage after a gig when I used to be a promoter. And there was a six piece band who had opened the, tore open the water bottles, taken a sip, put it down, forgotten which one was theirs, picked up another one. And at the end of the night, I walk in and I'm chucking in the bin, you know, 15 half drunk water bottles. And, you know, and that was for me, like, click in my head, like, I'm not doing this anymore. Like, here's a jug and some paper cups and... You know, it is that thing. Great riders are ridiculously wasteful, full stop. Mm -hmm. I think I think that there's also one of the things that in, in the variety of, of touring situations that artwork has been involved with is that like sometimes like the persistent asking of the question over and over again has been extremely useful. So even if it's not like you're going into a venue for the first time and you're and and there's something the writer or 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 something that's come to an agreement and they're like well uh we're just not prepared to do that or there's not time like that like that uh the, the we work with this idea within change like the change management side of things of the permeable institution they'll only like change as much as they want but if you keep asking that question each time like sometimes i find that you'll get the no because someone's just like I, i'm just not willing to change my mind and then the second time or the third time i mean it works with my kids they wear me down uh it's like you ask like that second or third time and they're like all right we're gonna look into it and then like that that sort of like cooperative we're all in this together i, I, I feel like i've i've less found people who are negative and like no i hate things i'm gonna get more water bottles and more just sort of like apathetic or it's like that just doesn't concern me yeah um, if you so, really yeah if you really uh hammer it home that that is a concern of yours and and if everybody who does feel like it's uh important is active in asking those questions that makes a big difference um that's a lot of what we're trying to do also with music declares in canada trying to connect with a whole bunch of different uh movers and shakers uh and power holders and just asking uh that's that's a big part of, of what we hope to do more. Uh, this is a good time, I think, for us to jump into, you know, we've talked about a lot of kind of roadblocks, uh, but looking a little bit more into possibilities, uh, I wanted to ask Ian if you could speak a little bit to a model for sustainability that you find really inspiring. Wherever it is in the world, I'm curious what they've done and how that's played into your work yourself. Uh, yeah, and it's weird to think of like the comprehensiveness of what sustainability can be because we can talk about it in terms of all the sustainable development goals. I think within like limited frames, two examples that that that, that sort of come up already. Uh, one is around the success of the well, now the creative green tools, industry green tools, uh, formerly from Julie's Bicycle, um, partially not just because like they function as an approachable way of starting to measure a carbon footprint. There are uh, tricky things with moving them from one place to another. That's why we're going through this long process with adapting them for Canada because our like power, the carbon intensity of the way that we generate power varies across the country. Whereas like the global average uh, for, for like carbon footprint by kilowatt hour is 400 grams. Uh, which like most people don't have a feeling of what that, that actually means, but that uh, the UK metrics are actually like slightly higher because there's older, dirtier power in there that are like closer to 600 grams. But then like Quebec is like less than two grams. Like you don't need to understand like what that actually means to understand that the difference it's because of hydroelectric and all of that. So it like changes the way that you prioritize things. So what I really like about them is not just that it's like, well, now, uh, different arts, uh, like presenting paradigms, whether it's music, whether or not it's theater, whether or not it's museums have a tool by which to see some of their impacts. And, and plenty of people, uh, especially early on, were really afraid to put that information out there because they're like, someone's just gonna tell us to stop doing something. And we don't know like that it's actually bad, but that it becomes a bit of a Trojan horse where now everybody, it's like that persistent conversation. That it's like, okay, now I have this information, what do I do with it? Um, and so it's had a lot of extended impacts that way. And then uh, the other example that I look at is uh, is a lot of how 
hillside uh approached it as well they were already doing a lot of different green initiatives just because that was sort of like the ethos of the festival itself um they weren't really uh when we started a partnership they weren't really um measuring too much of that they're just sort of uh, doing it so they actually started from a, a really low level but uh once we like came up with what you could measure and how people were impacting it and get, getting a picture it really sort of changed a lot of their thinking around what it meant because there is like should we be getting more solar panels or things like that and it turned out all their power was coming from hydroelectric before it even went into the grid so it was uh entirely clean but it, it turned out that like 97 percent of the footprint was from audience traveling to and from the festival space, um, which is not uncommon. And that uh, that changed like, oh, maybe we should be partnering with like around transit or educating the audience. And and that's what sort of got them to to that area. So like taking that whole picture of the organization. And I think that the most successful way is actually to sort of come at it from both ends and really put the art at the center of it is that um, it's about that connection to audience and community that we've been talking about. But then there are also these tools that that sort of allow you to prioritize and have conversations that you previously couldn't, even if you have that ethical concern in there. And by bringing those together, it's more, more holistically I've seen to be really impactful in the way that people have thought, thought about the way that they present and perform. Wow. And how is it, this might be a silly question, but how is it that somebody can do this kind of measuring work with you? Like, how do you get that, um, those tools in place, those ways to measure things? Yeah, I mean, there are, the, anybody can use the Julie's Bicycle tools right now. If you want to just use them for decision making and improving things, you're going to be working with UK metrics for power intensity, blah, 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 all of those different things. But like comparing and reducing, like it doesn't really matter what the units of them are. You can, so those are free, you can sign up for them. You can put in as much information you have or you don't, you can do it. Uh, the important thing is to do it um, more than once, so you can start to compare things and go see areas of improving. Uh, as more and more places around the world are adapting it or similar types of metrics for it, there, there, there's a, a benefit to having tools that allow the, to do that. So knowing that those are happening, like I said, it will be less than a year from now, there will be a comprehensive set of similar tools that are adjusted for the Canadian sector, which will give more precise things based off of our carbon footprints uh, in this country, but you can start using the tools today and they can move, move over uh, there. Anything that's sort of there, even if it's just starting, uh, anything that you can count that you think is having an impact will give you some sort of insight to it because there's huge capacity questions there. Like everybody is trying to do lots of things all the time. But if it's like, if you are still using disposable um, uh, uh, drinkware, like measuring that, I mean, like, how can I reduce this even in parts of it, that any sort of one of those, uh, it, just counting can be really useful to it too. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Wow. Well, I just wanted to give everybody a heads up that if you do have questions, uh, this is a great time to do it. And since we're a small group right now too, um, you're welcome to kind of add a little reaction like this and uh, raise your hand if you want to voice it verbally too. Uh, I see that Nicole has a bit of a comment about gatekeepers. Uh, I need to seek opportunities to teach my own, other managers, etc., and learn with my own to make these important changes happen. If we have just, uh, if we just have softer, deep softer, deeper conversations with our artists, we will begin to realize just how very important it is to them too. So important to remember why we support artists in the first place. That is such a good point, Nicole. And uh, I think that's a, a big lesson that I'm learning from this gathering is just how important it is that we recognize it's a community effort and we're all really um, kind of needing to be on the ball for each other and, and inviting more people into this space for conversation. So that's lovely. Can I, can I say something, um, Liv? We haven't actually spoken about um, veganism as well. Um, you know, when it comes to like 
riders and stuff like that and, and your festivals and I, I don't know if anyone's heard of Shambhala festival here in the UK but they were incredible in just deciding uh, first they stopped any plastic at all on the festival then they made it that everyone had to take their rubbish home they, they made their timing so that everyone could do pu public transport and everyone around in the festival scene was sort of watching them thinking you can't make such dramatic changes because people won't come anymore but the festival continues to sell out and and the last thing they've done is totally made it a vegan festival and it's a huge difference you know we we mustn't underestimate the impact of eating meat uh, on the environment so it's a it's yeah. a big message to put across as well there's a swedish festival called wild west which is a 30,000 capacity festival that did this uh, some years back and it was uh the effect was measured because one thing is the festival uh, uh, festival goers but then it was the whole press around it and the discussion and the topics and you know you had like so many ripples of uh, communication because they decided to to take a stand and also to share to, to which story you wanted to tell and I think maybe that's a super important part of uh, what we do is that we put stories on the stage and we can decide what kind of message we want to share totally it's a great example with Jambala as well yeah Adam and then Joel has his hand up and I think I was just going to kind of reiterate Kyle's point earlier where in, in to Nicole's comment as well um by setting yourself apart or standing on your own two feet and making decisions that are best what you feel for your business even though you're going against the flow pretty hard or people aren't going to think you're going to come or whatever actually elevates what you're doing in such a unique way and sets yourself apart so having those conversations with your artists and supporting them and empowering them to make those decisions can actually allow you to industry term cut through the noise and like take that take that next step um and i'm just going to answer my sister's question really quick if i may um I think I, I, it absolutely starts with the audience. You're buying merch, you're buying records, you're championing it on, on socials and online and all these places of like sharing it and encouraging other artists to follow suit. I think that there's that's such a cool reciprocal relationship that doesn't have to feel transactional, that's empowering art and an artist that by buying and supporting those specifically um, is, is, validating their choice to do that. Yeah, I love that. And also like how you make your way to that concert or something like that. Like I remember, I love how Hillside in Guelph, they actually have a bus system from downtown Guelph to get to the island and back so that no one had, or very, very few, fewer people have to be driving onto the island. And that's a huge thing too. Okay, Joel, I'm sorry you've been waiting. Yeah. No problem at all. Um, I suspect that as things open up, um, festivals will that do open up earlier than others will have more of a regional focus, or at least have more regional acts coming in, as opposed to bringing in, you know, let's say, however much percentage from out of the area. But moving forward from that, because regional artists all over the place are going to benefit from that, do you think there's going to be more of a focus on regional artists, getting as many people uh, close by and not flying into the festival as possible to uh, keep that sustainability flowing. I love that concept and I try to employ that all the time because I think that that's one of the things we need to do going forward is just, you know, there's no more jet setting around and one-off performances and stuff like that. And even if you're a festival, I think that you need to partner with other festivals in the region and make, you know, if you're going to bring someone and have four flights, even one flight to your area, then you should make that really count and make sure that the artist isn't coming back in another six months or three months. You know, you, we saw the, a lot of that before. Um, and I don't think that that's gonna harm anybody. I don't think anybody would be put off by that and it'll be beneficial for the artist because they'll have more plays around. Um, I really love the idea of developing things regionally, especially out here, I'm in Atlantic Canada where it's kind of rural and we're seeing more concert opportunities pop up as a result of COVID where towns that didn't have performance opportunities now are developing them because people wanna stick closer to home. They're starved for music. So 
I expect that bands will have more opportunities closer to home now. They won't have to travel 12 hours to uh, a bigger city, you know, and I think that that's great. Yeah, I just want to add to that, the, the festivals working together to book their headline acts and uh, accepting that the audience can come from nearby and it doesn't matter then if your headline artist is performing at another festival on the other side of the country because the audience is local is super important and um, so booking agents and festival uh, programmers working together is definitely the way forward for that but it is an opportunity for regional artists and um, but I think we've also for me personally realizing that instead of asking artists to come to my festival to showcase to get booked to play in the summer because my festival's in January like showcase online from your country and then get booked online to come in the summer um, so things like that, you know, we definitely need to look at what we've learned at this period of stillness and this period of uh, reflection is where we have to look back on and see what we've what we've saved in terms of the sustainable and the environment, what's happened this year and how we can keep that going. Totally. And I've also, um, oh, yeah, go ahead, Ian. Yeah, I was just going to say to also extend that to the production side of things as someone who works very often on the lighting and media side of things, especially with headline acts that are bringing in custom rigs because they're either aligned with the tour or something like that, that the sooner that you can get your technical managers, lighting directors involved in the conversation for planning, there's also a significant impact insofar as like moving gear around and uh, any sort of additional gear and energy impacts and any sort of measurements that you can do around that, there's a lot to be recovered around technical coordination in addition to moving the individual artists around too. And on a much, much smaller level, and possibly uh, something that might speak to some of the audience here is when you're doing routing in a country you don't know, speak to someone locally. And, and make sure that your routing isn't going to make you drive back and forth all over the country because I see that Canadian artists come to the UK and I look at their routing and I'm just like what on earth are you doing so you know reach out to someone in the in the local place and and see if your routing makes sense and if not change it mm -hmm. yeah trying to do more things in a smaller area is I think a big lesson that we're just talking about now uh, one thing I wanted to share um, as we kind of move into hopefully a, a brief resource sharing period uh, is relevant to everybody in this space um, and in fact anybody who has a bank account. Uh, something I've been looking into a lot more is um, where the, someone mentioned before you put your money where your mouth is and if you at least in Canada the big five banks are are really behind the times in terms of where they're investing their money and it makes a huge difference whether you uh or whether this music community as a whole is letting their money sit in a bank account uh where that money's going to fossil fuel companies or if you're looking into some credit unions that have other options. So every organization, every individual can make that switch. And I don't know if bank switch is just in Canada or beyond, but there's an organization called Climate Pledge Collective, which is doing a lot of this really good work. So there's good resources and um, other ideas that they're sharing on this campaign page bank switch. So I just wanted to share that. And if anyone else wants to share briefly before we wrap up, uh, just uh, raise your raise your physical hand or a, a re, or a reaction hand and and share away. <laughs> I'll um I'll throw one out there and I'll, I'll shamelessly plug the uh, music declares event we're hosting in a couple of days. Um, but I remember looking at the agenda and looking at the resource part. And I was like, ah, I don't really know what my go-to resource is. I find maybe some of the other Canadians can speak to it here, but so much of what we ingest is from the U.S. And Biden's doing this today and this is happening. Like, it's just so American centric. Um, the, and, and I love there's this girl, Emily, who does a blog called Heated, which is really great and I recommend to anybody to try to balance out the good news with the bad news or the bad news with the good news either way um but for any Canadians tuning in um the good war by Seth Klein was a really captivating read on Canada the history um the challenges we face engaging with the arts community um that as a resource I would highly recommend reading I'm gonna plug a, a 
podcast called How to Save a Planet, which is just a really nice approachable uh, uh, a um, conversation around a lot of climate topics. And the reason that it comes to mind is because the most recent episode I listened to was about the lack of a climate anthem. Um, and so I was dissecting like what within a social movement makes a good anthem. Uh, and so uh, particularly of, of, of this audience, if you know anybody who would be willing to, to, to create an anthem that we can, can share across the climate movement, uh, there's need for one. Um, but is an approachable way to start things. And then of course, tools, we mentioned Julie's Bicycle a lot. There is actually an effort right now because there are actually a lot of tools. There's an organization across many different entities in the UK that are creating like the uh, the green book for production. There's the Broadway Green Alliance, which does a lot of logistics things because Broadway tours tour in very similar ways in, in the US. But um, there's an effort right now to try and get these things to start coordinating together. Um, so that because all of them work in slightly different ways and it can be kind of overwhelming to be like, I found a, soci- a sustainable tool, but to, to have sort of more of a decision tree for that. So starting with all of those, also uh, everybody who makes a sustainable production tool seems to talk to each other. There's only so many people uh, <laughs> who are creating them. So starting with any one of them might lead you to others. Um, and Julie's Bicycle specifically has some guidance on green writers too. So outside of their tools to look through their resources as well. Yeah, and I'll just uh, I'll throw in there just to merchandise like uh, I think Adam is at your uh, realm possibly, but to to do your get your merch to produce to order so that you don't end up just chugging around with suitcases full of t-shirts that you then in the end end up giving away like or whatever, but just tell your audience that they can buy their t-shirt on your website and it will only get made to order so you're not wasting fabric. This has been. Uh... A pleasure. Thank you so much to these speakers, Kyle, Stevie, Linnea, Adam, Ian. You've been amazing, and I've I've really valued this time together.